This is Twit. It is time for an update, as I said, on the current state of facial recognition, both here in the U.S. and uh, abroad. And it starts with an excellent new article from Dave Gershgorn over at One Zero, a medium publication. Dave, thank you so much for being here. Thanks for having me again. Yeah, it's a pleasure to get you back. So let's talk about... Um, there's there are kind of a lot of different uh, acronyms that we've got in, in this article, and I kind of want to break things down so that folks understand uh, what's going on here uh, so that we can talk about kind of th this company itself, uh, U2 Technology, and I'm sure you'll pronounce it better than I do there, uh, as well as the Entity List and then the uh, NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology. So can we just do sort of a, a rundown of these three entities to talk about what they are? Totally. So um, the one to start with is NIST. So NIST, um, since about the year 2000, has been doing this test on facial recognition algorithms. It's tried to inspire the industry to um, to make better algorithms. So it's run this little competition. And basically the competition is that submit your algorithms to us. We'll see which one is the best and we'll have a leaderboard. Um, pretty standard type uh, you know, competition uh, as far as tech goes. Um, then as you wade more into um, – U.S. sanctions, there's the Bureau of Industry and Security. That's like actually not in the article because it's a little bit deep. But what you need to know is that these two organizations are both a part of the U.S. Department of, Com of uh, Commerce. So you've got the test and then you've got these this, the Bureau of Industry and Security. And they are um, the part of the Department of Commerce that deals with certain sanctions. So mm -hmm. in, in the 90s, there was this list called the Entity List. And it was meant to stop the proliferation of pro proliferation of weapons of mass destruction. Um, so basically, if uh, you were suspected of, of having a, a dangerous material, you would be put on this list. It was seen as a sanction. It's a public condemnation. And also, U.S. companies need like a special permit to, um, to do business with you. Ah. So it's seen as like a pretty sizable slap on the wrist. So now we're putting those, these two things together. Um, so you have NIST which is doing this facial recognition uh, competition, which in the last 20 years has grown to be enormous. It's the gold standard for facial recognition competitions in the world. Um, and a lot of companies uh, use it as marketing. So it's a, they got number one. They were in the top five. They were, you know, scored well on it. Um, but as tensions between the U.S. and China have escalated, um, you start seeing the U.S. government start to put sanctions on, on China, uh, including for human rights abuses in Xinjiang, which is um, the uh, territory, the autonomous territory within China, um, home to Uyghurs, the Muslim ethnic minority. And there have been reports of them being put in uh, re-education camps, internment camps, and uh, it's estimated that more than a million Uyghurs are in these camps. So – the Bureau of Industry and Security, part of the Department of Commerce, put a bunch of Chinese companies on this list um, saying that they were perpetrating these human rights abuses. They were allowing video surveillance um, for Uyghurs. They had facial recognition that was specifically meant to identify Uyghurs. And then um, they put them on this list. And now uh, companies like MegV, which is one of uh, the – China's largest facial recognition companies was actually planning to IPO in the U.S. Hmm. I believe it was in the U.S., um, but that didn't happen. And there's a lot of rumors that this is due to being put on this list. Um, and MegV has like protested and wants to get off the list. So while all of this has been happening, it's been business as usual at NIST. NIST is still ranking and auditing and giving free marketing to these companies that are. Uh, perpetrating human rights abuses. So the, the Department of Commerce is kind of has this double standard right now of both auditing and validating these tests or these algorithms while condemning them on the other hand. So I, I, it's one of those things where um, it's a multifaceted story, but at the heart of it, there's this, um, there's this conflict where you have the same organization condemning and like uh, approving the same kind of action. 
Right. Yeah. I have. I mean, so you've clearly drawn attention to this in in uh, publishing this article. But have either of these organizations addressed this specific issue here that we've got? Um, I mean, sh- surely they have to know that uh, this company is using uh, the the sort of gold seal uh, from one of our organizations as a marketing tool. Is there any talk about why this is happening or have they tried to give some excuse for um, why these things are both allowed to happen? So NIST uh, didn't get back to me. They said they, that they were working on something and then didn't, was, weren't able to turn anything around. Um, but what political scientists have said is that it might be in NIST's best interest to continue doing this because there's an element of uh, transparency and understanding what China is doing with facial recognition. Um, mm-hmm. I mean, obviously, their companies aren't compelled to send their best facial recognition algorithms over if they want to keep some, you know, internal secrets or whatever. But um, some people suggest, like Samuel Curtis, who I, I spoke to for the story, that you know the price of um, the letting Chinese companies use this as marketing might be small compared to the competitive advantage that the U.S. has in just knowing what kind of facial recognition Chinese companies have. So, okay, that's interesting because the benefit then, whenever you originally had stated this, what I thought you were saying was that it's good for U.S. for the U.S. to sort of know what technology is being used for the sake of of sort of understanding, you know, uh, uh, potential adversaries, but instead it's more about uh, being aware of technologies for the sake of, of competition. So less a um, protection and human rights interest and more a matter of making sure that you are competing at the same level. I think it's both. I think it's definitely the human rights. And I mean, I think that that like, so there are a few things. So I I think that both of your points are completely like on the nose. Um, I think that it's definitely a human rights thing. It's definitely an accuracy thing um, and competition. It's also that uh, NIST has been doing um, tests on race and gender and uh, inclusivity in uh, these algorithms. And by having Chinese companies compete, it kind of brings them into the same conversation as mm. we're having in the U.S., which is um, should facial recognition algorithms be deployed if they don't work on a diversity of skin tones? Um, and I mean, the counter argument to that is that like maybe you're just helping them make a better Uyghur detector. <laughs> you know, it's like right. so. The, the I think the the. There are so many questions that are still out there about this, and I think that the article that I tried to write was basically illuminating this conflict in the first place and then mm-hmm. you know, acknowledging that there are still a lot of open questions about whether this should be – whether this is actually a problem or whether it's something that's somewhat calculated from the US government. We just don't know. Gotcha. Uh, now, how popular – because – one of the things that I always find, and I think that um, you have brought this up before, is that the big companies, the, when it comes to facial recognition, are not often companies that we know. They, you, we think about um, Amazon and the Ring doorbell as one, but that's a small player in a very in a much bigger uh, universe, and so it makes me wonder. You know how much is this technology being used in uh, in China? Uh, is this a really popular technology? Uh, the, the the technology from U two. Um, uh, I'm curious about that specifically. Uh, is this something that at least in China is a very popular program, and therefore a sanction does have a bigger effect versus sanctioning something that is maybe not used as much? Does that make sense? It does, and I think that. Th- the companies that the UF, U.S. have sanctioned are mm-hmm. the, you know, the biggest players in China. There's SenseTime, enormous. Um, U2 Technologies um, is in 1,500 banks, um, a, a specific bran- branch of of, uh, of banks in, in China that is incredibly popular. So um, it's not like these are small companies that no one's ever heard of. These are like considered among the AI giants of China. Um, gotcha. So. 
they're they're definitely big i mean it kind of it depends how how effective these uh this blacklist is it kind of depends from company to company because some of them don't necessarily rely as much on us goods um or us ip which is really what the the blacklist targets so Mm -hmm. um it's kind of a a company by company thing but calling out these specific companies is definitely a big you know shot across the bow and it happened days i believe before trade negotiations last year so i mean it was it's undoubtedly seen as a political act 